Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Highland. All right, here we go. I'm sorry, I gave this wrong greeting. That's why y'all did respond. But all right. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible class. We're going to begin with a few announcements, as always, and we'll be led in an opening prayer and then a few songs by our brother Bryce Little. Just some, uh, a few uh, prayer requests that we want to be mindful of. Um, I haven't been given an update on Vicki Lomax, our sister Vicki Lomax, but I know that she is home. Um, and so we definitely want to keep her in prayer as she recovers uh, from her complications with her heart. But we definitely want to keep her in prayer. I did get an update on our sister Joan Munoz. Uh, she, um, of course, we all know that she uh, fell. Um, and uh, the doctors were, uh, uh, saw her today. Um, excuse me. Let me just read what I have here. Our sister Joan Munoz um, went to the doctor today after breaking her shoulder last week. Surgery is not required. Um, however, on Tuesday afternoon, uh, she had another mishap uh, that occurred, not on her, but in, on her house. Part of the ceiling in the bedroom collapsed. And luckily, uh, Vince or Joe were not in the room when it happened. So uh, prayers and thanksgiving for that, but I'm sure with everything going on with their health and things, it's not helpful. So we definitely want to keep uh, Joe and Vince uh, in our prayers. And our sister Grimes gave that update. Uh, want to continue to keep uh, Jean Smith, uh, who was admitted to the hospital with a possible aneurysm. I uh, want to keep him in prayer. And then also Joella Martin, who is the sister of Lee Harris. Uh, she should have gone uh, undergo um, second brain surgery uh, for her Parkinson's disease uh, this past week. Um, does anybody know if that was a success? or how she's doing it was a success okay so it was a success so just prayers for her recovery and then also we want to continue to keep uh, in prayer joe smith it was great to see him last sunday um, but uh, of course he's still uh, trying to regain his strength so please uh, continue to keep our brother joe smith in your prayers that is all the prayer announcements that i have at this time or at least that need to be updated um, one of uh, the upcoming events, again, we want to uh, remind uh, our ladies that the ladies' Bible class is still happening and will continue until mid-July. Um, so please, if you can, be here for that. This coming Sunday is our 4th of July celebration on Sunday evening after our evening worship. Uh, we will have a potluck and then we will enjoy some fireworks. So please come and be a part of that. Today really is the last day to donate for the fireworks, for the cost of the fireworks, um, because I will be going uh, to the booth tomorrow to purchase them. So if you still want to help with that, please see me after uh, class today. Uh, but tomorrow I will be buying them. And so please come and be a part of that this coming Sunday after evening worship. Uh, prayers for all those who will be going up to YBC uh, a camp this year. Um, so we will be leaving Monday and then we'll be returning next Saturday. So keep all those staff and campers. Uh, please keep staff in your prayers. Um, as we are going to be a skeleton crew basically with the amount of campers that we have. So, uh, so keep us both in your prayers as we will be traveling next week. Um, our Super Saturday is still going to take place in lieu of the fact that we could not do VBS this year. Um, we will do a one day event again uh, Saturday, July 24th from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. We will, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, so we will be having a meeting the week after camp um, because we may have to push the date back. So um, just disregard July 24th to be announced uh, what the date is going to be. But the speaker, I believe, is still going to be Nick Westberg. Is that correct? Okay, so he will still be the speaker. He's from the Tulare congregation. Um, but a date will be announced uh, hopefully soon. So... Um, keep that event in your prayers that we'll be able to finalize that soon. 
Um, and then of course the annual fall, Falls Lady Day that is hosted by the West Basilica Congregation is scheduled still tentatively on Saturday, September 18th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, the theme this year is Renew Your Strength from Isaiah 40 and verse 31. And Gail Jacobs um, from here in California will be the guest speaker. So uh, keep that event in your prayers. And ladies, if you can be uh, at that event, please do so. And we want to, again, um, keep in mind uh, the new baby Rollins, Joanna, right? Did I say that right? Joanna Faith Rollins, uh, who was born last Sunday. So proud parents, uh, or the proud parents, Luke and Carly. So we definitely want to keep the, uh, the mother and baby in prayer and also the father as well. Um, but uh, definitely a great news uh, of the birth of Joanna. All right, there are any other announcements that I am missing at this time? All right, if nothing else, let's go to our father in prayer. He had, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Who is this again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name. Peggy. Peggy. Okay, Peggy. Um, yes, absolutely. So uh, Peggy is now being able to return to church. Is that what? Okay, so she's now being able to come back to church. So uh, definitely prayers of thanksgiving for that, but continue to keep her in prayer uh, with her health situations. Anything else? If not, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we're so thankful that we can come before your throne of grace and truth. We're thankful that we can come and learn from your word, Father, and at this moment be able to um, pray to you uh, this thanksgiving of all the things that you've done for us and also make petition on behalf of those that we love and care about here at this congregation and abroad. Father, we, you know every single situation, every person. Uh, we have a lot in our congregation that are dealing with health problems. Um, who uh, have dealt with loss. Uh, we just pray that you would be with them and comfort them and guide them, Father, uh, because this life can be difficult at times, but we know, Father, that the reward is waiting for us as we try and strive to live for you. Father, we are thankful for this congregation. We're thankful for Highland and uh, what Highland means to us and means to you. And, we pray, Father, that we can continue to do the work here, not just in Bakersfield, but across the world as we uh, have different uh, avenues of where we can send and broadcast these uh, lessons and the work that we are doing. We're so thankful for that opportunity. Father, there are so many events that are happening. We pray that you would be with every event and that it be successful according to your will and that people may see you and want to glorify you in this. Father, we're thankful for all the teachers here at Highland. We pray that you would be with them as they lead our minds uh, in your word, Father. And we pray, Father, that your spirit will continue uh, to dwell in us and that we uh, can grow in uh, your ways, Father. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Without him, we would have no relationship with you. So we're thankful for our relationship with you through Jesus, our relationship with him, and our relationship with the spirit that dwells in us. It's in your son's most holy name we pray. Amen. Song number 374. 374. Yeah, 374. Is this thing on? Alright. Each day I'll do a golden deed by helping those who are in need. My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I 
can see me some is sinking low a few more days then I must go then I must go to meet the deed that I have done where there will be no setting sun to be a child of God each day my light must shine along the way I'll sing his praise while ages roll and strive to have some troubled soul life's evening sun is sinking low a few more days then I must go to meet the deed that I have done where there will be no setting sun the only life that will endure is one that's kind and good and pure and so for God I'll take my stand each day I'll lend a helping hand life's evening sun is sinking low a few more days then I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun I'll help someone in time of need and journey on with rapid speed I'll help the sick and poor and weak and words of kindness to them speak life's evening sun is sinking low a few more days then I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun while going down life's weary road I'll try to live some travelers load I'll try to turn the night to day the flowers bloom along the way life's evening sun is sinking low a few more days then I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun and the next song will be uh, number 629 number 629 Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue.
unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lid. Love one another, thus say the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus say the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. Love is much too pure and holy. Friendship is too sacred far for a moment's reckless folly thus to desolate and mar. Love one another, thus say the Savior, children obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus say the Savior, children obey the blessed command. Angry words are lightly spoken, bitterest thoughts are rashly stirred, brightness links of life are broken by the single angry word. Love one another, thus say the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus say the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. All right, I guess we'll go into our classes now. Did not catch that. There you go. Now I'm on. If you, if you didn't catch that, Brandon wanted to make sure we knew that uh, uh, Ellie and uh, his other daughter, and they're no longer sick. And uh, as they were announced, um, so that's good to know. And uh, uh, they're with Mama right now, and, and so just uh, uh, keep them in your prayers, though. You know. Kids always get sick, and then they get they get better and get sick again. It's just the uh, the roll of the dice with with children, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> okay, so a few things today. I have a handout that I that um, I wanted to make sure that we get to the hands of everyone, um, and for those uh, online, we'll we'll make this handout available. Um, later on tonight. But one of the things that we're going to look at is in our study, just um, uh, again, we're going to start getting into the books of the Bible uh, particularly. And of course, we're going to start at the beginning. So what uh, we, we are going to do is address a, a, just one item uh, that's kind of a big item of consideration, but we're going to give it a um, just enough attention that should help you have some scriptures 
uh, to, to reflect on, to uh, lean on uh, in your own study uh, in case you come across some issues when you do your own Bible study about something uh, like the authorship of, of uh, the book of Genesis. Um, for most of us, we would probably think that it's a, just a foregone conclusion. It should be just uh, an obvious, an obvious uh, matter, but it is not in other circles of academic study. And this began back in, in the um, 1700s, um, really uh, taking a form of proposal or hypothesis that um, challenged the traditional view that Moses is the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I want to do some quick review. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, it's really helpful to have a bird's eye handle on, on the Bible and the biblical story. It will help you understand why certain things happen in Scripture because of certain covenants uh, and because of the timeline in which uh, these things are happening. And, and so that's always a helpful tool to know um, and be able to um, help your reading of Scripture to know when these things are taking place. And the other thing is it helps you, the better you're able to articulate the story of Scripture, gives you a better sense and ability and confidence, I believe, to talk to people about Scripture. Because we will only talk about what we know. And people will give in, usually will show interest when they know or feel that we're confident about the things that we claim to know. And, and uh, I see that when we do sales, if you're ever in sales business or you're ever dealing with negotiating, if you know what you're talking about, you come off like you know what you're talking about, it's easier to have at least interest in other, by other people uh, what you're talking about. So this is, again, an important part of our review. And I'm using Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 as sort of our scriptural uh, perspective verse. Um, if you notice how it says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And so we have in this verse a perspective. This is how the book of Hebrews begins because part of the issue for the Hebrews that are being written to, and these are Christian Hebrews or Hebrew Christians, um, is that there's this challenge that has risen about the authenticity and genuineness of the Christian faith. And that challenge has created pressure, persecution, isolation, a sense of uh, being out of place and, and in some ways insecure. And it's caused a drift by these new Christians um, away from the faith. They're sort of returning back to biblical Judaism or at least the Judaism prevalent in their day. And as a result of that, the Hebrew writer or the writer to the Hebrews begins his uh, book by an observation. And the observation is in the past, God has used different ways to speak to his people over the course of biblical history or human history and now has communicated to us through Jesus. So I want to just make a quick point that this gives us perspective, a large lens, bird's eye view of how God has communicated to his creation, especially the Jews, uh, and then through the Christian prophets. Gives us perspective. And this perspective then can help us appreciate uh, charts like this. And uh, as I've said before, this is just a helpful chart that help us move through the story of Scripture. Um, and we have some convenient language to help us think about the story of Scripture where God had spoken to the patriarchs reached out to them through a variety of ways. Dreams, appearances, visions, and things of that nature. Uh, in fact, when we get into Genesis, we'll talk more about that. Today we're going to talk about the authorship of the first um, books of the Bible. 
But when we, when we think about how God reached out to them, uh, it becomes this plus written scripture as we get through the biblical story. But we see in this story God creating the human family. Out of the human family, we see the fall. In the fall, there, is, there becomes a series of, of unfortunate events due to sin. God has to, at various times, intervene, whether it is um, uh, intervening, trying to protect the human race from murder. That doesn't work. Cain still ki kills his brother Abel. Whether it is uh, to prevent... Uh, whatever the result of the sons of God and the daughters of men are, the Nephilim, um, and, and their progeny or their children, descendants. So God brings this flood, and we have Noah. And then through Noah, we see the, the new human race uh, emerge, but then they gather together to build this great tower uh, that's supposed to lead up into the sky, and almost as a competition or replacement of God and God confuses their languages. So he, throughout the step, throughout all this, we see God intervening, coming to earth, um, moving uh, in variety of ways, and then communicating himself, especially when we get to Abraham, who is the chief or the, be, the true beginning of God unveiling uh, to humanity that he has a plan. But there's something going on where the earth needs a blessing, needs to be blessed. Things are not going well, and they know it. So we see this through the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, leading them into Egypt. And from that, we get the Mosaic Law. In the Mosaic Law, we get obviously the, Mount, the story of the Exodus. We get the giving of the Ten Commandments plus the additional laws. We get the tabernacle system of sacrifices, the priesthood, the whole nation of Israel, the, the conquest and, and settlement of the land of Canaan, the united kingdom and the divided kingdom, and all these things in, in, interspersed and interwoven with the various prophets that spoke to God's people about their situation, why they're in it, what sort of promises yet to come, God promising the the Son of God or the, the Christ, a variety of prophecies. And then we get the arrival of John the Baptist and Jesus, uh, fulfilling a variety of prophecies in, in them. But most importantly in Jesus, the fulfillment of the law, but also his rejection, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, uh, and the beginning of the new covenant of Jesus Christ. And the preaching of that good news through the gospel. And so we, it's a mouthful to say, and I understand, but if we keep rehearsing sort of the skeleton of the scriptures, uh, we become better equipped at communicating parts of the story of scripture. Uh, and it helps us figure out areas that we might have some personal interest in. This is what I've been sort of rehearsing to you in when I said there's like a three or four point way you can do this. You can easily summarize the story of Scripture in terms of creation of a perfect universe. It's morally good, and it is, it is the perfect of all possible worlds. It's the best possible world that could exist, where free moral beings can have a free relationship with God if they choose. And in that world, guess what happens? You can choose not to follow God. And so as a result, you have creation, the fall, and we now live in the realm of the story of redemption, the history of redemption, where God is recovering, helping us have a relationship with him, and he does so through the patriarchs, the Israelites, and the gospel through the church. And through that, ultimately those that will uh, accept the gospel we have a promise of resurrection, and that will culminate at the end where we are reunited with God, our creator. So this is another way of just talking about the story of Scripture. Uh, and I think you could do this and memorize it pretty easily, um, and we'll keep going over it. And I'll make sure you get a copy of that at some point. Um, any comments so far? Is, do, does this help? Is this, an easy, is this an easy way to kind of envision the story of Scripture? 
I see a lot of ups and downs. Yes, okay, that's good. Yes, all right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we'll make sure we, we keep that mindful. All right, so um, <clears throat> we're going to get into uh, Genesis. And at this point, we could just swap over to our scripture text and our, and our um, PowerPoint on the, uh, online. Here we have our Bibles. We can open them and look at them. So, as I said, we're going to, Genesis is going to be part of a, a two-part study, uh, partly because the authorship of Genesis affects understanding the authorship of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as well. And as I had mentioned in the beginning of our study today, um, one of the things that, that I want to uh, talk about was just some scriptural references to the authorship of, of Genesis and, and the law itself. And I've given you a handout where I've um, put this in sort of a, a more article essay style. It's not an outline, but it, it does provide us with some references uh, to look at. But one of the things I want to uh, give you a sense of is why this study is even necessary. So <clears throat> for a long time, it was just presumed that Moses wrote these, these scriptures, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And uh, it was essentially never really questioned in, in, in Jewish history. Uh, even when Josephus in the first century was uh, sort of rehearsing or rewriting. Uh, I don't know that rewriting is the best way to frame it, but maybe summarizing the entire Bible. Uh, he wrote a book called The Antiquities of the Jews. It's a, a multi-volume uh, book he wrote or a series of books on, on the history of the Jews. So the antiquities or the history of the Jews. And he was very, it seems very clear that he viewed Moses as its author of, of these five books. In other words, even by the first century, uh, there was no other view. By Jesus' day and time, there was no other view. Uh, he had at various times claimed, what did Moses say? in the scriptures. What did Moses say at the beginning? Uh, here we'll have a few examples of this. Um, <clears throat> go, um, go to Matthew chapter 19. Go to Matthew 19. And this is a, this comes up as a question regarding marriage and divorce, but we're going to just focus on how Jesus argues this discussion. Um, we can, we will at some point in time get into the text itself, but, but today I just want to focus on how Jesus argues the authority of the texts regarding um, divorce and remarriage in the Old Testament. In Matthew 19, he says, verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus had finished these, these sayings, um, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And, Pharisee and, and Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So Jesus is going to respond to this question. Now notice, is it lawful? And the implication is, does, do we have authority from the law? And this in particular is the law of Moses. And he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore the man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So what book is he quoting? Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. And then he adds, What therefore God has joined, let not man separate. He, he affirms that. Since God made them one, he says, No one should make them, no one should break them up. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now notice how they respond. What do the Pharisees believe about the, the teachings in the, the, the Torah, the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? They said, why then did Moses 
command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now, they're referring to a particular law in Deuteronomy, most likely, because there was a particular law there about if a man had see uh, some unseemly thing in his wife, he can give her a bill of divorcement. Um, this had... Um, this is a kind of a debated passage in, in some ways as to what is that unseemly thing. But the short of it is, uh, Moses wrote about it, and they cite this, and they cite it as the words of who? Moses. All right. And he said to them, Jesus responded, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. But notice how Jesus responds. Moses did that. Again, he is not even, he's not saying, well, you know, somebody wrote this down and, you know, we just kind of collected it. And it's, you know, scripture. But someone wrote it. We don't, we don't, know, to, we don't know who. Jesus refers to Moses. Now, some might argue, well, Jesus is just being, you know, accommodative. He's just saying, well, the popular belief is that Moses wrote these books, so he's just kind of giving in. Well, I don't know who's, now who's reading into the text. And I think we need to be mindful of that. But I wanted to give you that particular passage as an example that, that Jesus believed that uh, Moses wrote uh, at least, you know, that particular part of Scripture, an essential part from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Another passage comes up. Um, <clears throat> we get into uh, Matthew chapter 22, dealing with the resurrection. In Matthew 22, verse 23... And let me be mindful here. I'm not arguing that these will absolutely convince anyone who doesn't believe Moses wrote all of the books of the law. But these are helpful argument passages to show us that as far as Jesus is concerned, Moses is the author here, the human author. Now we get Sadducees coming. And here, beginning in verse 23, in the same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must carry, uh, excuse me, must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And now there were seven brothers among us, and the first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third, down to the seventh, and after that, after them all, the woman died. And in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her as a wife. Now listen to, um, first, Jesus does not rebut them regarding the authorship of these passages or these commands. But Jesus answered, you are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, you have, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Now, my point here right now is just to give you a little, little sense of, of how Moses is considered in the first century, the, the author of, of these books. Uh, there was no other view here. Jesus didn't go out of his way either to affirm something different. But what I want to do is look at a few other passages, more from um, the Old Testament itself. For example, let's go to Exodus 17. We're going we're to be hopping around a little bit in the books of, of the law, of the Pentateuch. We've got to Exodus 17. <clears throat> now, in Exodus, 
uh, well, throughout the books of the law, especially Exodus and forward, there are a series of verses that show God commanding Moses to write the, the events that we're reading in a book. So listen to this. In verse, verse 14, Exodus 17, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. And the Lord will war with Amalek from generation to generation. All right, so in this particular passage, it's just a quick note, right? We don't, see, we don't see Moses rushing off and, you know, going to his study and, and getting out quill and ink and all that. But, but God is telling Moses to write these things down. This particular promise that he is going to wage war against Amalek. Um, and then if we uh, skip down to verse, excuse me, chapter 34. I'm just using a couple examples here. In Exodus 34... Verse 27, we have another, we have another event like this. Um, in Exodus 34, Moses is, rest, is uh, being focused on and uh, we have this uh, moment of renewal of the, co the covenant with the Israelites. Listen to this, beginning in verse 27. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words. For in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. And so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and he neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And so here we have Moses now doing the new commandments. But here we have again, where did those laws get rewritten? Well, we have them in Exodus 20. Moses writes these down. They're available to us. Moses is responsible for the writing down of the issues in the law, like the commandments. There's no other person listed in the law who is given the responsibility to communicate in written form the details of the law. Let's go to another passage. In Leviticus chapter 1, and uh, you know, in the outline or the uh, handout, I have the verses we're going to be looking at on page 2, but they're not, you won't read the verses themselves. If you want to know where we're headed, uh, it's all there for you to follow. But in Leviticus 1, 1 to 2, it says, And the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. That's the, that's the tabernacle. Okay, the tent of meeting, saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any of you brings an offending, um, an offering to the Lord, excuse me, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd. Well, I have the wrong verse there. Um, let's see. No, I, I remember what I want, why I put in this here. Um, the book of Leviticus is based on God speaking to him from the tent of meeting and then him writing down the Levitical laws of sacrifice. So if you can consider Leviticus being sort of Moses writing down all the different requirements that God has spoken to him about uh, the Levitical system. So that's an, that's an essential verse uh, regarding Leviticus. Um, Another particular passage is in Numbers. In Numbers chapter 1, as I said, we're going to hop around a little bit and we'll, we'll open the floor for some discussion in just a moment. Um, in Leviticus, in, excuse me, in Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, this again reaffirms that these books are the result of God communicating to Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, 
Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male head by head, and so forth and so on. And again, my point here is, there's no other person God is communicating. To. And there's no other person where that information is being asked of and for him to communicate and re-communicate that to the people of Israel. And it's that material that becomes these books. Moses is the only source here. Moses is the only person in the position to write uh, these things down. Now let me get to another passage in Numbers chapter 33. Chapter 33. In chapter 33, verse 1 of Numbers, and this is going through the uh, recounting of the people. These are the stages of the people of Israel when they went out from the land of Egypt by their companies under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Listen to this. Moses wrote down their starting places, stage by stage. By command of the Lord, and these are the stages according to their starting places. And now chapter 33 of Numbers is a summary of the writings of Moses, of his, of his notations about the, the steps and movements of the Israelites from even the city for out of Ramses and the timeline here. But notice, it's God who told him to do this. God tells Moses, chronicle these events. Chronicle these, write these things down. Take notice of their beginning places, the time, the, the year, the, the cities, the people. Keep a record of all of this. And we, we have moments like this throughout the book of, of, of script, all different scripture books. That there are moments where they summarize these events. And then there are moments that we then expand on different points of the story. And so Moses, again, is the only one being called to do this. Now, did he have a team? Did he have, you know, I mean, can one man uh, by himself, like, chronicle every single person's event? I'm sure he had a team that helped him. But ultimately, Moses is responsible for this. I'm not trying to get into the mechanics of how Moses did it. My point is Moses is the one that is viewed as its author. He's responsible, he communicates it, and then it becomes the book of Scripture that we have in front of us. <clears throat> so that, that's uh, what we find in Numbers 33, verse, verse 2. And you can, chapter 33, if you're interested in what the Israelites did in their movements, you might be interested in reading that some more on, on, your, on your time. Um, <clears throat> in chapter 31 of the book of Deuteronomy, um, we have some interesting passages, a concentration of passages to look at. So in the book of Deuteronomy, and I'll give you some time to get there, but in Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning in verse 9, um, there are many, a variety of times when Moses, it is said that Moses began to speak and all these other things. But listen to this. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in your in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place where he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner with your towns, within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law. And that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Now, now notice in this particular passage from, from verse 9 to verse 13, Moses is, there's a few things being said. Moses wrote this law. Now this is not re referring to this requirement, I don't believe that. 
It's referring to this sort of summary of all the things that are contained in the law. He wrote this law. The law itself. And then he gives it over to the Levites who are responsible for the Ark of the Covenant. And so now the Levites are responsible not just for the Ark of the Covenant. They're now responsible for safekeeping the written law that Moses wrote. And it is required that every seven years the law in its entirety is read to the people. And everyone submits to it. Everyone comes. Babies or little children. And even the, the, the pilgrim, the Gentile who lives in the land of Israel, who is part, a participant in the land of Israel, but still a Gentile. But it all begins with the logic. He wrote this. And now they're going to continue to keep what he wrote. All right, let's go to verse 19. This is God. Now therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths and this, that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land, of, land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and, and grown fat, they will turn to the other gods and serve them and despise me and break my covenant. And so forth. he goes on and talks about I write this song. And the song of Moses is found in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. And it's sort of this lamentation, lament, um, and, uh, you know, elevating God, um, condemning paganism, etc. But, but notice, even the song, God says, write this song down. Teach it to them. Make them learn it. There's this direct connection between God's teaching and expectations, his servant Moses, to write it down. And then the expectation that whatever Moses writes, the people of Israel must absorb. They must, you know, put in their mouths um, this idea of make it part of their vocabulary. Make it part of the, the way they talk. It should be the vocabulary of their faith. But it begins with, write it down, Moses. Write it down. <clears throat> In, uh, we can get to verse 24 um, before we get to the song as well. Look at this, verse 24 to verse 26. When Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book to the very end... Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, even today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come evil will befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. So I'm sure after Moses wrote down this song, uh, this prophetic song, anticipating the corruption of Israel. He's got a little edge on him, but, but I want you to notice what he's saying here again. The text says, when Moses had finished writing the works of, the words of this law in a book to the very end. You can almost feel the, the mark of that pen and that ink dropping at the end, the last period, so to speak. And then he says, here, Take this, that it may be a witness against you. Um, that it may be a witness against the people of Israel. That God has anticipated their, their rebelliousness. Um, that sin is not going to be a surprise to God. But nevertheless, it must stand. And it stands as a witness. So, 
just these verses um, provides, an, I think, a, a sufficient amount of, of uh, support for us to not be worried by different theories about how these books were written. You know, ancient books are not written or published the way we publish books today. You know, when I, if, I, if I ever write a book, you know, I will, write a, I will write the manuscript myself. I will use a computer. I will have people, you know, read it. Have, you know, sort of editors just to read it. And then I will reread it myself and edit it with the suggestions. And then I will submit it again to the publisher. And they will publish it. They will make it look pretty. They will have different kind of paper. They will have pictures and all sorts of stuff that I, I, I didn't think about. My point is, we think about an author like that, book publishing, very, very kind of solitary like that. In the ancient world, you needed people to make paper by hand. You needed people to put it in a scroll, create the ink for you. You needed people to, um, you know, provide the right kind of paper document for you to use. On and on and on and on. So I don't, I don't suppose that Moses just got it right every single time, that his hand never spilt ink or, you know, I, I'm, we should not think of ancient writing like that or the process of inspiration that every single time God wrote, had a prophet write, it was always perfect every time. The product is what is inspired. The process is God using, blending the human side and, and the divine side together. But there would be considerable amount of other people involved. What the, one of the theories that is often the most common, and you'll find this everywhere, is because of the variety of different names of God used throughout the different books, that that must mean that that was a different author altogether. And that the, the scripture was the product of a variety of religious infighting in Israel. And someone said, I'm going to take this page and I'm going to stitch it to this page and I'm going to take this story and I'm going to attach it to this story, you know, and we're going to blend all of these different views together so we get, you know, these books. That's a very complicated process. And yet there's no evidence for that except for what they see in the text as it stands and they, they tend to have to peel the passages apart to prove their case. And I find that really inadequate and far more difficult. What seems more simplistic is Moses was called to write it. He wrote it down. There was a process that it took to put these stories together as he wrote them, as he was inspired to. And we get a very large set of writings that cover the, for, the 40 years he was with Israel. And, and it covers both the heritage of the promise, Genesis, and Genesis, we'll talk about when we get into it, but then we get the, the, the real beginning of their story, Exodus, and you get a variety of other passages as well. So um, I said I'd have time, but if you have a question or a comment, uh, I'd t I, we have time for one. If not, okay, we'll be excused. Thank you so much. I hope at least um, uh, giving you something to think about, maybe seeing some passages, and, and in particular that God has called Moses to write these books and these passages can help you uh, at, least appreciate, at least appreciate that particular point. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're dismissed.